Millions of years ago, a piece of Africa drifted off into the Indian Ocean. A strange and isolated world was born. One of the last places on Earth to be colonized by people, Madagascar is an island lost in time. Separated from the continent, species evolved along their own paths. Nearly every plant and animal is unique. Here and there are clues to an early Africa. The famed monkey-like lemurs and the peculiar fossa, which seems to be a cross between a cat and a mongoose. But today, as the human population grows, the traditions of the island people threaten the future of all Madagascar's inhabitants. The island is one of the most endangered habitats on Earth. The plight of the people, the animals, and the plants is now receiving international attention. Madagascar will be an important test case for new and unusual conservation efforts. And the world will be watching. Madagascar, first light, celebrated in song in a forest like no other on earth. This precious rainforest is the home of the Indri, a type of lemur, our distant primate cousin. Like virtually everything else here, the Indri is unique to Madagascar. Ninety percent of its animal species and eighty percent of its plants are found nowhere else. Lemur means ghost, a fitting name for these spirits of the forest. Today, lemurs are ghosts for another reason. Their populations and their forest homes are only shadows of what they once were. Madagascar is vanishing before our eyes. This biological treasure is being consumed from within. Today, a huge international effort is underway to save the island, a land whose natural riches we are just beginning to discover. Yeah. Madagascar's first human settlers arrived as recently as 2,000 years ago from Indonesia and Africa. Today, their descendants, the Malagasy, are a mixture of these Asian and African cultures. The traditions of their ancestors are still widely practiced. One of these traditions is killing the island. Madagascar is burning to death. Burning clears land for farming, creates pasture for cattle, and turns trees into charcoal. The population has more than doubled since 1950, and as the population has grown, so have the fires. 
More than a third of Madagascar is slashed and burned every year in an effort to support 11 million people. As the forests turn to ashes, each gust of wind takes with it a piece of living history. For Madagascar is a window into the ancient past. It broke off from Africa nearly 200 million years ago. Its plants and animals evolved on a separate path. Evolutionists joke that if Darwin had visited Madagascar, he would have come up with all his evolutionary theories in one week. As one French explorer noted, here you meet bizarre and marvelous forms at every step. He could have been referring to these unusual baobabs. Or the cat-like fossa. Or perhaps one of the spectacular lemurs. The fossa is a relative of the mongoose. Evolving in isolation, it has become Madagascar's biggest and most powerful predator. Shifaka lemurs warn each other of the danger. The fossa usually hunts at night under cover of darkness. In daylight, the adults are on guard, but this Shifaka baby could panic and let go of its mother. The Fossa launches a frontal attack. Retractable claws and raised pads on its soles make it a highly successful arboreal predator. Its acrobatics seem to match the lemurs leap for leap, but the fossa does have its limitations. It cannot climb a tree trunk wider than the stretch between its two front paws. A large baobab might as well be a glass wall. The Shifaka family is safe. It's now midday and miserably hot. Temperatures in this forest can reach 107 degrees. In the cool of the night, the fossa will try again. At dusk, another member of the mongoose family hunts on the forest floor, the baki baki. The Malagasy giant cockroach, four inches long, will provide a substantial meal. Other giants evolved in Madagascar, though many, like the giant lemurs and the elephant bird, became extinct after human settlement. But some giants remain. The Malagasy giant jumping rat is the size of a rabbit and one of the 10 rodent species unique to this island. They emerge at night to feed. Each family maintains a system of burrows. After foraging, they must dig the front door again, for they always close the entrance behind them. Latecomers must identify themselves before being allowed back in. dawn, the start of another blazing hot day in the dry forest of the west. The long dry season has begun, and the few watering holes are drying out. It could be nine months before it rains again. 
baobab trees store water in their spongy, bottle-shaped trunks. Dependent on the surface water, the birds have to make the best of a dwindling supply. Many of Madagascar's birds, like this sparrowhawk, are descendants of immigrants from Africa. But they've evolved on a separate path from their African relatives. The Malagasy Harrier Hawk is much more colorful than its African cousin. The birds now congregate at the lagoon, which has been reduced to a mud puddle. Most of the water that remains is below the surface. The harrier is not just thirsty, it's hot. Beneath the top layer, the mud is cool. The harrier applies a cold compress to a vein close to its skin, lowering its body temperature. Not only does Madagascar offer exotic bird watching, but it's been called a herpetologist's paradise. More than 90% of its reptiles live only here and seem remarkably unafraid of people. As an added bonus, all the snakes are non-venomous. The snake's bright red color, as if dipped in blood, inspired the name given to it by the Malagasy, Fandrafiali, which means pierces its victims. They believe it kills its prey by falling rigidly from the trees, impaling its unsuspecting victims below. More than half of all the world's chameleon species live in Madagascar. And this one, over two feet long, is the largest. Chameleons are harmless, but many Malagasy are terrified of them. They're believed to be the manifestation of human spirits not yet at rest, and are thought to have dark, magical powers. According to one old saying, the chameleon's independently swiveling eyes enable it to keep one eye on the past, one eye on the future. But the future for the chameleon and for all the wildlife of Madagascar is seriously threatened. Forests are disappearing at a terrifying rate, not by the chainsaws of international commerce, but by the axes of poor and desperate people. A staggering 85% of Madagascar's forests have been destroyed. The assault continues. Many conservation groups have focused their attention on this unique island, now listed as one of the 10 most endangered habitats on Earth. Here at Ankarana in the north, these forest guards are being trained by the Worldwide Fund for Nature as part of a 15-year plan to help save what remains. Patrols help protect the forest from illegal cutting and burning, but this is only a partial solution, a temporary band-aid on an enormous problem. The people of Madagascar will still need fuel. They will still need land to grow their crops. The guards know the tree poachers will be back when the wood is dry. They have had some success in stopping the destruction, but as a result, they face growing hostility from local villagers. If we simply try to enforce the law, as has been done at the Ankarana, the guards lose the respect to the local people and the local people get hostile. We had to go down to the Ankarana last week to hold a public meeting to explain to people the role of the guards, what their job was and why they were there. Because the guards said there was an area they could not go into. The local people had been threatening to kill them.
Some regions have natural protection, like the Ankarana Massif. Brittle spheres of limestone stand guard around a secret world that few have seen. Worn by the action of thousands of years of tropical rains, the rocks are as sharp as knives. 400 feet high, they form a seemingly impenetrable fortress. This is one of the most undisturbed places in Madagascar. Inside these walls lie pockets of forest. Ground lemurs find refuge here, enjoying a drink at pools that spring from underground rivers. They need large quantities of water to dilute the toxins in their leafy diet. These rare lemurs are found only in one small corner of the country. They are some of the last crowned lemurs in Madagascar. Other wildlife has also found refuge in this fortress. Scientists studying Madagascar's insect world have only just begun to scratch the surface. These are Malagasy flatted bugs, among the most beautiful of their kind in the world. The immature bugs are covered in curled filaments produced by wax glands on their abdomens. The purpose of these filaments isn't clear, but they probably make them unpalatable to birds. In the vulnerable transition to adulthood, their resemblance to hanging flowers is truly amazing. As adults, they're ostentatious, but this is actually another floral disguise. Birds can easily spot individual flatheads, but clusters of them so closely resemble flower petals that often they simply pass them by. On the forest floor, a vivid chestnut-colored mongoose hunts for just about anything, insects, eggs, worms, and young birds. When foraging, the mongoose pokes its nose into every nook and cranny. Thanks to their broad diet, they are still fairly common. Mongoose are famous for attacking snakes, though the size of this boa constrictor discourages even a team effort. Barely visible in the fold of a tree, a nocturnal lepi lemur rests outside its sleeping hole. The Malagasy have many myths about these wide-eyed inhabitants of the treetops. To them, lemurs are their ancestors from the forest. As they sit motionless in the trees, these rare Sanford's lemurs seem to stare with curiosity, not fear, at human onlookers. Virtually all the remaining Sanford's lemurs live in the Ankarana, most of them in a place called the Grand Canyon. But even a forest in a canyon isn't safe. A powerful commercial logger has been cutting trees here for years, cleverly and illegally. Une fois on a attrapé des gens qui coupaient le bois. One day, we caught him cutting the trees without legal permission. We tried to confiscate the logs, but he gave money and gifts to someone in the Water and Forest Directorate to cover it up. 
Sometimes we still find bulldozers, chainsaws and other materials in the protected forest. Secretly hiring village labor, George Karma and his business consortium have reaped rich and ill-gotten rewards. Yet they blame others for the destruction of the forests. People accuse us of being the exploiters of the forest because we have the machinery and the permits. But the truth is, we're not. Doctors, vets, soldiers, anybody. They all cut the forest and they do it without any permits. Every time there is a problem, they blame us, but it's really the black market. We wish we could tell the authorities that. Then there would be no problem, and we could continue working. The wealthy rape the forest for profit only, but for the villagers and peasant farmers, tree cutting is a matter of survival. These village elders are hearing about an agricultural aid program. The aim is to persuade them not to cut the forest and to safeguard their long-term futures. The villagers would be sympathetic to the appeal if they had a choice. Nearby, there is a protected forest. From the outside, it appears to be intact. But on the inside, hidden by the remaining canopy, is a banana plantation. Farmers are growing their crops here illegally because they have nowhere else to go. A private company with strong government ties called Procops appropriated their fields, their only means of survival. The villagers have been forced by Procops to farm in secret in order to feed their families. People have been sent to prison because they broke the law by cutting down the trees, but they don't know where to go. They no longer have their fields in the valleys here. They are desperate. They just don't know where to go. They can't go into the valleys because they're now occupied, and they can't go into the forest because it's forbidden to cut down the trees. All across Madagascar, slash and burn farming continues to eat away at the forests. Once the farmers were able to move on and allow the soil time to renew itself, now there is nowhere to move to. The warning signs of catastrophic erosion cover the hillsides. Officials trying to stop illegal clearing feel helpless. I was frightened by what I saw in terms of slash and burn of the slopes. So I went to see the local authority and I said, how do you allow this slash and burn to take place? And he said, Monsieur, je m'excuse. This morning, just this morning, I have here a farmer, Paisan who told me he has 12 children and he has a very small plot of land which doesn't give him enough food to sustain his family. And he asked me for a permit. Now, what can I do, he said. Shall I condemn that family to death? The result of this assault on the earth is awesome. In the highlands of Madagascar, this is a common sight. As far as the eye can see, a devastated landscape where the hills have collapsed. Eventually, the hillsides will become a sterile moonscape. Without trees, there's nothing to stop the ruinous mudslides. As the red clay is washed from the hillsides, it clogs Madagascar's streams and rivers. A torrent of red water crashes down towards the ocean. 
astronauts have even noted a red ring around the island from space. The Betsy Boca, the island's largest river, is like a severed artery. Madagascar is bleeding to death. The fishermen of the Betsy Boca Delta have become accustomed to working in these permanently reddened waters. Nearby, fishing trawlers marooned on the silt are now relics of the past. It's as if time is going backwards here. High technology vessels displaced by the small age-old outriggers of the local fishermen. The Malagasy do not seem to be alarmed by all the evidence of the ecological disaster around them. It's not complacency, it's more a belief in the power of fate, and above all, a belief in the power of ancestors. This festival of the dead is called a famadian, a turning of the bones. For these villagers, the spirits of their ancestors are still part of the living community. They believe that all problems, including natural disasters, can be solved by drawing on the power of the spirit world. Exhuming bodies is a way of pacifying the dead in the belief that they, in turn, will protect the living. Amid a carnival atmosphere, the bodies are shrouded in white ceremonial cloth. In a culture where human spirits never die, the concept of a dying natural world is difficult to grasp. The remaining fragments of forest are also full of spirits. Some of the lemurs are protected because of their spiritual power. Others, however, like Cockerell Shifaka, are hunted for food. Madagascar is a world of mythic beasts and the spirits of the dead. But it is also a developing country. Necessity has made the people cut their natural world almost to the heart. But it is hoped there may be a choice. Music in the cool dawn plays through the strangest forest on earth. A forest that is completely without shade. Here the trees are clad with tiny leaves and large cactus-like thorns. In southern Madagascar, these didyria trees have adapted over millions of years to a climate with little or no rain. Once their thorns protected them against thirsty prehistoric animals, but they seem to pose no threat to the Barose Shifaka.
The acrobats of this spiny desert, the Shifakas leap between the thorny trees without injury. They do not have specially hardened hands or feet. Apparently, their jumps are just so finely judged that they take the thorns literally in their stride. This forest is armored against animals now long extinct, but the trees have no defense against people. These are Antandroi villagers. For centuries, they have lived among these strange trees. Their name means people of the thorns, but now they are destroying their homeland for charcoal. <laughs> Shallow pits are dug to burn one of the most ancient woodlands in the world. Throughout Madagascar, there is a desperate need for fuel, and most of that fuel is wood. As the island's population has grown, so too has the demand for charcoal. It's now produced in larger and larger quantities, then packed and transported to towns many miles away. And the villagers here still believe that the forest will always keep them from starvation. No, no, the forest will never come to an end. Yet the government want us to move from this forest because they say that nobody has ever made charcoal here before. But without the charcoal, there is nothing else we can do to make our living. Our lives will be impossible and our wives and children will starve. A Malagasy proverb says that the forests, like true love, are without end. But the evidence tells a different story. Deeper into the forest is another Antandroi village called Hazafuts. This village is far from main roads and exporting charcoal is impractical. The people of Hazafuts keep cattle, but they eat meat only on important ritual occasions. Their lives are ruled by fadi, or taboo. This forbids them from eating many of the wild animals. <laughs> Their diet is mainly vegetables, sweet potatoes, manioc, and maize. So far, the forest around their village remains largely intact. In contrast, most of the country's forests have been lost. Yet even in the deforested areas, Madagascar is still capable of remarkable surprises. One of the rarest lemurs lives in a small patch of northern forest, the Golden Crown Shifaka. Until 1989, no one recognized that this lemur was a separate species. It has never been filmed before. These ragged lines of trees are vital pathways connecting the patches inhabited by the golden crown shifaka. But even these pathways are being cut down.
The Shafaka groups live in separate patches, but to ensure the survival of the species, the groups need to interbreed. They must be able to travel between their woodland oases. The Malagasy buzzard is unlikely to seize an adult lemur. But the Shafaka are afraid of all hunters in the sky, and they won't run the gauntlet without the cover of trees. These Shafaka have been discovered just in the nick of time. These forests were due to be cut down for charcoal. Now, they're likely to be protected by law. Today, the world recognizes the plight of Madagascar's unique animals, and extinctions are not inevitable. A small group led by scientist Don Reed is working to save a species that has been hunted even closer to the edge of extinction, the plowshare tortoise. This breeding program received Malagasy and international support at a time when only 30 animals remained. Plowshare tortoises get their name from the prong that juts out from the bottom of their shell. The prong can be used as a weapon to drive off rival males. If ordinary pushing and bullying don't work, the prong can be used to turn the opponent on his back. This time, though, the loser knows there's no contest and moves away to avoid being tipped over. The victor turns his attention to the female. Now the prong has a different purpose. This aggressive behavior is competition to another male, but it's courtship to a female. The male uses his tail, which has a groove along it, to inseminate the female. That's the end of his parental duties. The female will bury her eggs. The surface of the nest will be baked hard by the sun. This keeps the eggs safe from predators, but it brings other problems. Sometimes the rains come very late here, as they have this year. We're still waiting for it to rain. It should have rained about a fortnight ago, and we've had virtually nothing. So we've had to water the nest, because when the temperatures get above 40 degrees, those sort of temperatures for any length of time can be critical for tortoises. It could kill the baby. We found in our first or multiple nesting season that the babies may hatch out of the eggs but can't leave the ground because the ground is too hard for them to dig their way up. Opening the nest helped to save all the babies. In fact, we saved all our babies last year that could be saved. After just four years' work, this project has doubled the world population of plowshare tortoises. If they can be released safely into the wild, it will have been one successful skirmish in a long war. In Madagascar's capital, Antananarivo, the busy market is the starting point for a battle against another kind of extinction. Botanist Nat Kwanza is looking for clues to some of the forest's most closely guarded secrets. Among the herb stalls is ancient folk knowledge about the forest as a source of medicine. For example, the leaves of the rosy periwinkle, found only in Madagascar, have been used to fight two types of cancer, 
childhood leukemia, and Hodgkin's disease. Avocado. Avocado. For abortion. For abortion. Avocado. No one knows what other secrets could be found here. But in modern Madagascar, the people's collective memory of these medicinal cures is starting to fade. And soon, it could be lost forever. Most of this information on the uses of the plants are passed on from generation to generation. And in the course of doing this work, we came across an elderly person and he didn't know anything about medicinal plants, which to me was a bit strange. So I said, how come? He said, my father died before he could teach me. So there is that chance. If we don't document the information, we might lose it. To record this information before it's lost, Nat Kwanza and his students have to travel to an isolated mountain in the north of the island. Perched on the mountaintop is a tiny village. This is the family home of Undranala, an ambiash or medicine man. With the knowledge handed down through generations, Undranala knows much more about this forest than any trained botanist. Almost all of his cures are unknown to Western science. This is a forest pharmacy, one of Madagascar's greatest untapped natural resources. Today, projects are underway to help the Malagasy people reap the financial rewards of these drugs. This would be one way of using the forests without destroying them. Here in the rice fields, Madagascar is attempting to respond to the challenge of feeding its 11 million people. This country leads the world in per capita rice consumption. But age-old methods of planting and harvesting no longer meet the country's needs. Yields are far below their potential. Development projects have provided funds to improve rice farming throughout the country. In many places, they've been a great success. But here, in the Northeast, the project has been a disaster. Pumps and sluices were provided to direct the flow of water around the paddy fields. The machinery, expensive to buy and difficult to repair, was constantly breaking down. This was not because they were poorly made, but because they were clogged with silt. Silt from the erosion of nearby deforested areas. Without the pumps, the farmers could not grow rice. If the erosion isn't curtailed, there is little to gain from all the money being spent here. The funders are now reconsidering before they spend any more on this project. Once again, slash and burn takes its toll.
Forced by its desperate poverty, Madagascar must look for any potential solutions to its problems. One possibility lies in the island's vast, untapped mineral wealth. But its exploitation will affect the lives of many Malagasy, some more drastically than others. These are the fishing grounds of the Antonouche, or the people of the island. The lakes are not only a source of food for them, everything under the surface is the realm of ancestors. But their waterways and the nearby forest have a new leaseholder, QIT, a subsidiary of the giant mining company Rio Tinto Zinc. This corner of southeast Madagascar is rich in ilmenite, the mineral sand used in the production of titanium. Serge Lachapelle, the mine's director in Madagascar, notes that the project will change the lives of the Antonouche. Well, they're surely going to be affected because this project will probably create uh, about 600, five to 600 direct jobs. Mining will provide hundreds of new jobs, but many of these will be given to trained personnel brought in from towns and cities, not to local villagers. Yet Madagascar could make a great deal of money from this mine. The questions then are how much will filter down to the poor and what will be the impact of such a massive environmental assault. This will be the site of an industrial harbor. Its development will wipe out the sacred Antonouche fishing grounds. Yards away stands the village of Ivatri. The villagers say they are afraid of the mining company, and an incident at a nearby sacred site has increased their suspicions. We found some people at these tombs and we asked them, what are you doing here? They said they were from the mining company and they wanted 50 or 60 meters of land, including where our tombs were. They asked us what we wanted in return, but we told them they were treading on our tombs and so they would have to make a sacrifice and kill a cow. We didn't want them to come here, but we are afraid because they were white. The mine will also cut through this rare sand dune forest. QIT claims they will more than restore it, but for a unique forest like this, that is nearly impossible. We could replant it as it is, but I believe that people will want us to put trees on. The shape of the forest will probably change a little bit. But after five to 10 years, uh, it, from here, it will look basically the way it looks now. The animals, like this boa constrictor, will also be in the way of the mine. An environmental impact study is now underway. A final decision on whether the mine will be approved has not yet been made. The forest is home to a rich variety of wildlife. No one knows how many species will be lost by the destruction of forests here. Some species, like this chameleon, can be found throughout Madagascar. But other species, like this carnivorous pitcher plant, are found only here in the southeast of the island. The sandy soils provide little nutrition, but that's taken care of by the animals lured to their deaths.
Loss of forest must be weighed against financial gain. It won't be an easy decision. The potential profit from the mine is so vast it could reduce or even wipe out Madagascar's annual trade deficit. A key investor, the World Bank, says its support depends on the results of the environmental report. We know that the project is economically feasible. We still don't know what are going to be the environmental costs. Now, suppose the Malagasy government uh, would decide that despite the cost, it would wish to go ahead with a project. The international community may attach a higher cost than the Malagasy government or the Malagasy people to the environmental impact. What will be the situation then? Will the international community be prepared to compensate the, the Malagasy government for the loss of revenue? The international community is trying to help. The lemurs' haunting cries may be answered. Conservation groups like the World Wildlife Fund and Conservation International are now using one of the latest funding techniques, debt for nature. They buy part of Madagascar's international debt at a discount. In return, Madagascar is required to spend the full value of the debt on conservation. Roderick Mast of Conservation International is very hopeful about the possibilities. The beauty of the debt for nature swap, of course, is that, that uh, uh, seemingly everyone wins in this scenario. The, uh, the conservation organization wins because it can uh, turn a, a dollar's worth of donation into two dollars worth of conservation action on the ground and uh, the government wins as well because not only is it able to support conservation and get the the good public relations value of, of, of a move like that but it's also able to uh, reduce its debt burden conservation projects now focus on more than just preserving wild lands funds are spent on the villagers as well developing new farming techniques hiring them as guards and guides, and providing them with alternative fuels. Madagascar's crisis is not just an environmental one, but a social one as well. All efforts to save its wildlife must consider the needs of its people. An old Malagasy legend tells of a great fire that swept through the island's central forests a thousand years ago. Today, the fire still rages. To the Malagasy, burning means survival, but now the burning has to stop. And that is the crux of the problem. At the present rate of destruction, the forests will be gone in 30 to 40 years. The Malagasy may lose their future, and the world may lose more than 200,000 species. This eroded landscape, villagers struggle to feed their families, and the problem is only getting worse. The population is growing at one of the fastest rates in the world. Half the people are under the age of 14, and family income is only $200 a year and falling. Madagascar's only hope lies in its people, a people who have always looked to their ancestors for guidance. But now they must change and, like the chameleon, keep one eye on the past and one eye on the future.
Go crappie fishing with host Dan Small on Outdoor Wisconsin, next at 9 here on Channel 10. This is PBS.